One, two, testing, testing, Do testing. Do you want to put your mic on this or on the shirt? Yeah. Uh, one, two, three. It's fine. It's fine, yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm in the back corner. I'll tell you time. All right. Okay, and Nash is here. Good. Can I just sit over here in kibitz as you talk? Yes, and then you will take over. <laughs> take over for what? All right, so we're good? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So basically, people lied to me because they told me like they will not be bringing slides, and every presenter, like speaker here, had slides. So I just spent the last 60 minutes doing this, <laughs> <laughs> and now I have slides. Um, all right. So this is this is how we represent the address on the node. Like this is what uh, communication is using, and um, the idea here is that you have your host, your UDP port, and the key that identifies your node in, within the network. And that, unfortunately, is a lie, at least for now, because this is how it really looks like. We generate some UI ID, and for it, we use it as a part of that identification here. Now, uh, how, the, how the communications will change over time, I hopefully will speak at the end of this presentation. But for now, just stay with me that still that name, even though it's randomly generated as UUID, uh, identifies the node within the network. So we had no discovery. Uh, this, uh, we had a peer-to-peer -peer network, and the peer-to-peer -peer network is implemented with Kademlia. And obviously, like if you have to do your slides within like 30 minutes, you, you can use Wikipedia for for your slides. So, <laughs> like, if you guys are gonna ask me how Kademlia works, I don't know yet, because I didn't have to really know at, up till this point because Chris sort of implemented the whole thing and it was working. So hooray! So what's the point? But unfortunately. Um, maybe fortunately, there will be some changes that will be done within, uh, within how the COM works. So I'm at the moment reading about Kademlia. But if people are interested in the paper, it's available online. And in general, they have this little tree here that they ho hold uh, information about nodes. And that tree has some, some specific capabilities, which makes it all performant and whatnot. But we are not really focusing on this. We just sort of believe that it works. And Kademlia needs a transport layer for it to work. Uh, it, it, within, the, within the paper, there are some messages that are being sent uh, between the nodes. Uh, we are not implementing the whole specification. We are only implementing the ping and the find node. So ping allows us to well ping other nodes, while the find node makes a lookup for the list of nodes that we are, might not be aware, aware of yet. Um, and oh, crap. So you guys probably don't see anything here. That's not good. Is there a way to switch off those lights over here? Probably not. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a screenshot. Ah, uh, yeah, whatever. I mean, I can use this. Do you guys see it yeah. right now? All right, so, Proto. Um, so, di uh, yep. so, this is how. We are representing this, uh, the Kademlia protocol. I can make it a little bit bigger uh, using protobufs. So you will, you will see that we have this ping and pong as a response. We have a lookup. So lookup corresponds to that find uh, message that you, that you can find in the, uh, in the paper. And lookup response is obviously a response to that. And then we have, and then we have this. So uh, this last message called protocol, this guy, so it will, it will, it has all those other previous messages. So ping pong, look up, look at uh, response, and well, one another one disconnect when we want to disconnect from the network. And that sort of is only Kademlia specific at this point. When we are sending messages, uh, so th this was designed in a way that it could be sending any kind of messages, not necessarily what we need. It could be just designed like anybody could just take that that binary and, and use it for their own peer to peer network. If that was a good choice or not, <coughs> depends. Uh, I have my strong opinions about it because this guy is really a pain in, 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 terms, of, uh, in terms of code I'm writing. Uh, but anyway, anything else that we are sending over this protocol will be closed over this upstream. As you can see, the type is any. So uh, as you can imagine, that might be a pain. But we will, we will see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is. Um, uh, but yeah, but this is how it is. So, like, no, I, as I said, I'm just showing you guys what we have at the moment. We can talk about what we could do about this uh, within communications uh, at the end of uh, whatever uh, my slides are here. So, uh, anyway, so uh, 
I just have to jump back to slides just to remember what I want to show you guys. <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, so this, those five slides will work. So this is how Connect will work. So here you have your, your little node. It might be a bootstrap node, or it might be somebody working in the network already. And you have another node here that would like to connect to this node. Like how does he know about this node? Well, it can either be a bootstrap node, so he has the address of that running node over here, or maybe Kademlia working underneath had this node discovery, so, so this guy will constantly every few seconds ask underlying Kademlia protocol, hey, give me a new peers that maybe are available on the network, and if he finds some, something that is new, he will try to connect to it. And the connection is made in two phases. Um, so the first phase sends this encryption handshake uh, message, which sort of sends the public key of that given node over here. That nice animation, right? Um, <laughs> that encryption handshake is received by this guy, so now he has a public key of that node that tried to connect to him, so he sends the, his public key as a response. Uh, so now those two guys have the uh, knowledge of the public key of the other party. So now they say there's a, there's a second phase of the protocol that kicks in, and that actually sends this protocol handshake message which for now doesn't have anything at the moment, but uh, what's important is that that message is being framed. Uh, what it means that it, this thing is being encrypted, so it, once it's being sent over the network here, already this message is being encrypted using this, guy pub, this guy's public key, so he can decrypt it, and if he understands the message, he can send the response back, and the nodes consider themselves as being connected. So far, so good? That's the only animation that I have. Um, <laughs> There's also like one little optimization. So if two nodes used to, used to talk to each other, they exchange public keys, uh, one of them disconnected or whatever, and they try to connect one more time, what will happen is that that node will immediately, like if I know the public key of the other party, I will immediately just jump to the second phase of the protocol and just send encrypted message to that guy. And if I receive the message back, then we're good. Uh, and yeah, all right, so Emacs it is. Um, all right, so. Was that? Uh, probably yes. I like. I have. I have really weird things in my Emacs. So like, whenever I save something, Emacs will tell me, "Good job, way way to go," and stuff like that. So you be, you might be surprised. Anyway, um. <laughs> well, it's on, only because Nash thinks my code sucks that I have to you know motivate myself. <laughs> Um, so those are the messages. So those are the messages one more time I in front of us. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as you can guys see that that frameable message here stores protocol handshake and pro protocol handshake response because those are being sent as uh, already closed over frame. So now, um, and yeah, so this is, a, this is basically here our protocol that we have a disconnect method, hello, and encryption handshake and and encryption handshake response, those will, those will navigate not encrypted, but everything else within the, within the protocol as it is implemented right now is closed over frame. So, so if you remember, if we, we remember we had this little app stream here, right, in the, in the Kademlia protocol, this is, oh, yeah, sorry. So those are actually the messages which will be part of the, of the app stream. And, and yes, each time I have to sort of guess what type it is and it's, and it's a pain. Um, all right, so slides. Uh, okay, so um, communication has this, so this, all the needed abstraction about what it means to communicate between nodes is closed over this type class called communication. And there are a few methods. So for example, run trip tries to send a message to a given node with a given timeout and uh, uh, sort of expects a given message back or error. Or you can have ability also to broadcast a message um, to all of the nodes that you're aware of. You can, for example, this, this method, find more peers, will, will query, uh, um, will run a query to Kademlia asking, are there any new peers that I'm not aware of I would like to try to connect to and, 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 and things that, or, or number of peers available right now. So this is abstraction that we use. Uh, and um, I will show you that, that abstraction, how it's being implemented in a second, but what, yeah, what I would really like to show you is how, uh, yeah, I had slides prepared so some ugliness is hidden, but now you have to live for the ugliness. Um, 
So, so all right. So this is the first. So this is the first first phase. Uh, give me a second. There we go. You still see it? So this is the first phase of the protocol. You know, we um, we lock some stuff. We fetch the encryption keys. We we run some time. We fetch some time counters so we can actually later on uh, push metrics if needed. And then we create that encryption handshake message. We get the remote. Um, we create this protocol node thing here for our peer. I will tell you that what it is in a minute and why is that horrible. Um, but anyway, once we have that message, that encryption handshake message, we use that round trip method from communication to send that message to that node. And we expect uh, a response back. Depending on whether a response exists, yes or no, we either, uh, we either uh, deal with that or we have an error. And once we have that uh, message back, we fetch from it the public key and we store that public key into our store and we log that we basically uh, fulfilled the first phase of the protocol. The second phase is it's pretty straightforward. So the second phase looks like, uh, there we go. So, so now we expect a message, we expect a message um, I'm sorry, we send a, we send a message um, protocol, protocol handshake, which is closed over this frame message, so it encrypts it. We send it one more time using this run trip method from communication, the message is being received. And once that we receive that response from our, from our node we try to connect to, we consider ourselves connected so that we, we add our, that, that remote node to our list of nodes that we already connected. Um, and, um, so that final connect method uh, here, uh, wait a minute, I'm looking for it. So this, uh, so this is basically, this, this fork apprehension here, this little guy is actually running the, 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 the connection. So what we do is that we fetch a counter, we are saying we connect into the given peer, uh, we increment the counter on the metrics, uh, fetch, the, fetch the key, and then we do two things. If the key exists, so if we already, if we connected to that node in the past, then we can actually run just the second phase protocol. But if we, if we haven't, then we have to go through, through the full handshake protocol. So full handshake is just the first place, phase followed by the second phase, while this second phase or full is just second phase with attempt. If, if the attempt was successful, then we're good. If it wasn't, then we have to go through the full handshake protocol. And that's what it is. Does it make sense? Cool, because it's Scala code and Scala is ugly. Um, all right, so we done that. This, all right, the, so the transpiled layer. So, so far, we, we really haven't seen transpiled layer running because it was all you know, hidden from us through that type class communication. We don't really see how the internals are implemented, and we see this in a, uh, right now. So the way it's being implemented, it's, um, it's here. So uh, there's a class called Unicast Network, and it wraps around this ability to send messages uh, over, uh, over UDP. So we are using UDP, UDP, and we're using it here in the Unicast com. So that's, uh, oh crap, okay, okay, don't matter. Unicast, where are you? Not this. Unicast. Okay. Uh, it's definitely somewhere here. There we go. Um, and yeah, as you can see, it's it's using it's using UDP. And and this, the question is whether this is good or not. So as you as you just probably saw in a minute, but I know I was jumping between between slides and between screens. But the problem that we're having is that if you look at the, the API that we are using from the communication, from this abstraction, it's all the time just, just round trip method. So even though the underlying transport layer is using UDP, we are sending messages as we would be doing that using TCP. We send a message and we expect message back. And that's a problem for a number of reasons. Um, if you guys are interested, I can show you why, what, the, what the problems are. The problems that I like really pain for, for me are ones in terms of the runtime in terms of implementation. So for example, in terms of runtime, uh, you sometimes if you run the node, you will, you will see those messages in logs saying uh, a message out of sequence. And that, that happens for a reason. I send a message to that other node and I'm expecting the, the message back within the given timeout. 
that message never receives within the given timeout, so, so I give up, I start doing other stuff, but at the same time, that message just arrived. But I wasn't expecting this message anymore. So I'm, I'm just logging this, it is out of sequence. Right? I'm, I'm trying to emulate UDP, uh, with UDP at TCP at this point. Um, and there are, there are other problems. So, uh, so one, of the, one of the things that is really killing me is, is this little guy. So, um, right, so if, for example, if we go to, to that um, connect method, which is over here, you will see that uh, when I'm connecting, I'm using, I'm, I'm, so the arguments that I'm taking are basically the peer that I'm trying to connect to and the timeout, right? And uh, the peer node is this, this class, little class here, is, is, it's pretty straightforward. Like if we try to um, class peer, peer node, okay, I don't know what it is. Peer node, peer node, doesn't exist, I don't know. Should be here. So my C tags aren't working for some reason. But anyway, uh, peer node is it, it's not that peer node. There are other peer nodes in, in our in our class. Well, it doesn't matter. Basically, the problem is that 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 sort of this little class is just a structure. It it has two things with it: uh, identification and uh, an end endpoint, which represents the host and the IP address, and that's all it is. And that's that that's that's pure. That's that's just a structure. Nothing in it. Really nice to reason about it, comprehend it, test it, or whatnot. But you might be see that if we if we have the communication uh, type class here, I'm not actually using that peer node. I'm using something which is called protocol node, and protocol node is created only for the sole reason that we are using UDP, not TCP. So because when I'm sending a message to some other node, I'm expecting from in the let's say I'm sending a handshake message, I'm expecting response from that node, but I also need to know know whether this is actually response for the for the message I have sent. Maybe this is something different. Maybe this is something out of order. Maybe this is something out of sync. Maybe this is a very old message. So, so protocol, uh, protocol, protocol com. Yeah, messages carry sequence numbers and time steps. And yeah, I can actually show you that. Um, so this is it. So whenever I send a message, it, it sort of has, if, it, if that message represents a response, it will have two things. So every me message has a header, but also it has also a return header. So that if, if, I if I receive a message here with some given header, I will send you a message back as a response where that return header will, will have some information from the header I received you from. So, so you can do here, you can do the equation and see whether the sequence numbers match and, and time steps match and, and, and all that. And, and this is like, I don't want to go into details, but this is sort of killing me. Like the, the number of uh, abstractions that had to be built to sort of deal with that was, uh, well, it's just too much, and um, yeah, I don't like it. So, where are my slides? Uh, that's it, that's that. Well, yeah, that's, okay, so what's next? So, uh, I, I hope at this point Nash will take over, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yes, uh, because I'm dehydrated, um, and yeah, without water, I'm, you know, uh, anyway, um, so what are we thinking is there, there are basically two things. Like, uh, first of all, we try to implement encryption, um, and, and there are so many ways that you can break it. So instead of doing that, maybe we could use something that, which is robust and, and, and it's been here for like 25 years so far. So uh, we're, we're considering using TLS. So if we go, okay, so the, the first motivation that we have is just go from UDP to C TCP. Because like, like uh, uh, this is what Nash pointed out, that that's for now we're just sending very really slow small messages, but once we start sending something bigger, then if you start send something bigger in, in terms of those little packets close with uh, UDP packets, that's that's also a pain because now you have to keep the synchronization of the packets and all that, basically re-implementing TCP at this point without back pressure. Um, uh, so yeah, so maybe in, maybe instead of running TCP uh, uh, UDP, let's 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 go to TCP implementation and. One of those approaches that we could use would be just to use gRPC services, which gives us this little um, TCP implementation underneath. I don't really have to deal with all the craziness that I'm doing within that code that I haven't really showed you. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and we have one, one cool thing for free, and that is TLS. And that, is, that means that we wouldn't really have to do the two-phase uh, of the handshake protocol 
where the first time we exchange messages, only we would have to do the, 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 the single one, the second phase of the protocol because already every mes message that would be sent over the, the, the protocol would be encrypted from the beginning. Now, if that's a good idea, that, that sort of depends. So there are technical issues like we are trying to discover whether this is possible to retrieve from the gRPC API the certificate of the, of the other node. Like this is apparently doable right now on the server side. It's, it's hard for whatever reasons to be done on it. Uh, technically, it's possible, right? The question is whether gRPC, and not really gRPC, whether the uh, Ioneti is giving that API for us as a users, or do we have to you know, fork Ioneti and, and, and dig through the code and, and just find it somewhere out there? The other problem that was pointed out to me yesterday, and we didn't really have, re have time to talk about it, is that the, the, the public key from the certificate has, like, I, I think there were some requirements about like what kind of uh, cryptographical uh, algorithm we're we going to use and whether this is supported by TLS or not. So I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if that's, if that's the case. Like, because Mike that says it is. It is supported or? Yeah. Okay. I think that's an excellent question though, right? Like, like it would be ideal if the wallet keys for a validator and the TLS certificate were to use the same set of keys. That way we can identify the validator by its TLS negotiation. Say, oh, I know who you are because I see that you're using the public key associated with this wallet. Yeah. Um, if that's not the case, at least we can use TLS to get transport security and then we can do a, a handoff of key material, but that's and also, annoying, and also right? what I don't know, and, and this is what Chris was pointing out, that how many, like how many connections gonna be there? Like how many connections, TCP connections I have to open for a given node if I'm using TCP, right? That's like, Maybe this is something that we should do, like a proof Depends of concept. Depends on how many calls you're making simultaneously, right? So, yeah. so one of the nice things about gRPC is that it does connection pooling and connection management for you invisibly, right? So uh, if, you're making a if you're sending a lot of messages to another peer, and you, it'll, it'll open up multiple connections to allow you to make multiple you know, RPC calls yep. at the same time. Uh, in general, validators are gonna have a lot of open connections, yes. right? Read-only nodes can have many fewer con open connections because they only need to connect to a couple of validators to get the data feed and make sure that they're getting a reasonably up-to-date copy of the blockchain from one or two validators and then they can look and you know, then make sure they have everything that way. Sure. Um, but in most regions that we're gonna want there to be uh, full, as close to full graph interconnectivity <laughs> as possible, right? That that. Yeah makes the network lower latency. Um, in situations where you have, where you can, like in regions where you can accept higher latency, you can have lower interconnectedness rate um, percentages for the validator set, uh, but you, you know, the network gets slower when you do that. Yeah. So, but basically there are like, so right now there are two problems we had to struggle with, and I think those are separate. So one, one of them is the UDP versus TCP. That's one thing, because we could still use gRPC if the TLS is a problem. And so that's one thing, just going from UDP to TCP. But so right now there is a, so the problems that we, we are sort of facing is that Catamilia is a little bit, a little bit tightly coupled to the underlying transport protocol. So we would like to decouple that using FP. So just Kademlia can, 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 instead of being a factual thing, could just return an effect, and then we have this clear boundary between, between the, the transport layer and the, and the algorithm that is responsible for no discovery. Um, so that's one thing. And the other, if that is working, it can be working on gRPC, we can then also, like we have to, we st are struggling right now whether to, we are able to receive a certificate uh, on the client side from the service side. It's definitely doable in Go. Uh, <laughs> But I don't know if that's actually, I shouldn't really say it. Um, because now somebody will shout, let's write it and go, and I'll, I'll be just leaving. I'll, you will see me. Uh, you, you will never see me write stuff and go. Um, never write it and go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's all for my part. I don't know if you have anything to add. Well, let's see if we have any questions. Does anybody have any questions at this point? So the TLS question. Hold, hold on. Wait, is there a mic? Yeah. Thank you. So for TLS question, um, then you'll be relying on third party to uh, verify your certificates? We didn't have to. No, yeah, we don't need certificate validation, right? We just, like, they can be self-signed and that's enough. The, so the point of TLS is to mostly to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks, 
make sure that we know who we're connected to, not to guarantee that you know um, the identity of what you're connected to. Okay. So if your transactions are already you know encrypted or verified using your blocks, you know what you are going to transfer the messages, right? They are already signed messages. Do you really need TLS? No, that's that's the other way around. Like it is already done, but. Okay, so I've, when I was trying to sort of discover what can be done with TLS, TLS I found this really cool YouTube video. I can, I can share it on, on, on Discord. You have to receive their keys so that you know which of the validators on the list you're actually talking to. I think the question was why we encrypt messages other than just sending a signature. So right? the way I see that, you know, the comm layer should be dumb, completely a dumb pipe. You know, it should, that's where consensus comes into picture. I think those kind of things should take care of your messages, how messages are valid or not, because that's any way you're going to build when you're sending messages to, from one node to another node. Um, so personally, the way I see the comm layer should just pass the messages, and upper layer, um, at the abstraction from comm layer, uh, should take care of the rest of the things. You know, the message signing, signature, or encryption, uh, algo algorithm, and that sort of thing. Cool. Any other questions? All right. You nailed it all, Pavel. I can dance for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I will take the opportunity. If there are Scala developers here, and I see some, so I will be doing, uh, uh, after the recap sessions, I'll be doing a little presentation about um, MTL, Tagless Final, how that we are using this uh, in, in com. I mean, I will be not showing communication. I might. I have another example where I just want to show you guys like what are the benefits, and I have some benchmarks running, and I have some open questions for Greg, so if you could come at least for the last end of the presentation, sure. um, especially after the, the benchmarks are shown. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, thank you very much. Wait, I have a microphone. Mic. Yeah, yeah. I thought I was too loud. Like I said, thank you, and it just echo. <laughs>
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, we'll rifle through this really quickly and uh, give you guys an early lunch break. Uh, what we're trying to do is just walk through the 24 entities that'll be coming uh, tomorrow and day after and just go through the go through all the companies, tell you what they do and why they're excited to be building on our chain. We're going to spend, call it, 30 to 45 seconds on each one. Before we dive into them in any detail, I will say that there were two points of feedback that were universal from all 24 of them, and, or feedback or questions. One is, what does the timeline look like? And, you know, uh, Meta, you'll probably have 100% attendance for that meeting. And the second thing was, uh, what does it cost? Because many of these applications, as you'll see, are extremely high volume and of the, call it, microfinance uh, sort. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Lee and uh, Kevin, who I think Kevin's covering the first few ones. And we'll just go in order really fast. All right, so the first one is uh, Shop, which is a decentralized e-commerce platform that basically allows you allows consumers to take back their data. Uh, they presented at the Governance Forum, for those of you who are there. Um, they are, uh, basically, they've come out with their first marketplace, um, and you could sign up for that, but they're, they will be building on our chain. We'll have a product at Mercury in order to, that allows you to basically earn tokens um, if you would like to give brands your data, and if you if you don't, you don't have to. Um, uh, expansive, uh, David Otto presented this one at, at the governance forum as well. Expansive is um, is about co tracking of commodities production uh, of of tracking of production and um, sale of commodities around the world. Uh, so many of us don't know that. Uh, commodities have a lot of different features, like one barrel of gas does not equal another, or barrel of oil does not equal another bar barrel of oil in terms of how it was produced, um, where it comes from, that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, so Expansive is, is leveraging uh, our chain to be able to kind of track that globally uh, for a bunch of different types of uh, commodities. Uh, Blockchain and Berkeley is a partnership that we formed with um, with the Blockchain and Berkeley team in order to get them um, helping to educate people on rolling and building on our chain. Uh, and they they are helping with a bunch of our uh, portfolio companies around um, tokenization and, and ec econometrics and things like that, um, as well as marketing and, and that kind of thing. Um, do you want to do Bridget? Oh, Bridget, sure. Yeah. Uh, Sweetbridge is a company currently, uh, it's going through a fundraising round now, and so this is why we're involved. Um, but they're looking at creating a more liquid economy around supply chains, and so thinking about how you uh, push value further out into the supply chain between where the value is created and the end consumer. And so if you think about sort of supply chains and the lack of transparency, what you end up having is a distributor who ends up um, accruing all of the value in the supply chain. Thanks. Um, and so, yeah, so the next one's Govern. Govern's a, uh, a governance protocol, basically, that will be, um, some of their first applications will be helping us to understand how we govern within the co-op. Um, and we'll be, we'll be making more announcements about what they're, what they're doing there. Uh, they're, they're based in Seattle as well. Um, Open Platform is, uh, is right now working with a, a few other currencies, but it's basically a, a Stripe-like API uh, to be able to accept um, tokens and, and other digital currencies on um, kind of real-world applications, if you will. Um, WitNet is a decentralized Oracle network um, trying to solve the, the Oracle problem of using off-chain data on-chain um, or cross-chain data. So being able to uh, utilize uh, tokens from Ethereum on our chain and being able to tell, um, being able to understand what's happening outside of the chain. Um, NetVote is another kind of governance platform. It's a voting platform. They are, they've made a couple interesting strategic relationships in terms of trying to uh, first attack shareholder voting um, and how that works within corporations. 
um, and how your voting can be private but verifiable. There's a couple good talks on that out at the Governance Forum. Um, and these guys have, have a pretty interesting solution for how you can be both private but be able to, to uh, see that your vote was counted and counted correctly. Um, and last is ACX Network, which is another sort of uh, decentralized governance platform that can that looks at building financial inclusion solutions in um, in West Africa specifically. So they right now have a network of of money transfer agents of about 300 agents and 17,000 customers, um, and they'll be implementing our chain as a um, governance mechanism and a way that their token can can move around and interact with with people there. Um, yeah, I'll. I'll get the next few. Um, Reshore is a micro insurance platform. Um, they're looking to insure episodic things, such as an Uber ride, an Airbnb stay. If you want to insure against, um, call it the, um, the deductible, if you want to go play tennis in case you break a leg, you don't want to pay for the ambulance fee, th they want to do that. What's, what's really great about this is they're actually partnered with existing insurance companies because insurance companies just want to get as much product uh, as they can. And so they're, they're basically going to be responsible for the offer design and the token economics. Extremely large uh, total addressable market. Uh, Cogill is trying to build a data science uh, uh, and research platform for the asset management industry. So a little background on why this is important. Uh, asset managers spend about 40 to $50 billion a year just in North America on research. There are two big legal tailwinds that are going to happen in Europe and North America. And that is, currently, all of this research is bundled with brokerage fees and trading fees. Um, both Europe and North America are going towards a model where you ha have to actually pay for the research directly, and it can't be bundled. And so that really opens up a 40 to $50 billion ecosystem that requires the piping for people to buy research from the sell side directly. Uh, Veriledger, very apropos today, given tomorrow's tax day, Veriledger wants to make uh, the TurboTax uh, for the uh, cryptocurrency market. And uh, founder Megan is actually in the room and uh, a part of our, uh, our co-op. Universe, um, Universe is a rebanking platform for uh, countries such as Kenya, Sudan, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, et cetera, where people don't have options for saving. So you know, their banking system only allows them to hold their own fiat. Their, um, their capital markets have you know, one or two stocks listed. So there's no real way to save. And so this is to create essentially a banking and saving system for those countries. For example, if you could give someone in Kenya the opportunity to put some of their money away in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that would be great. Um, Turnt uh, is based on the premise that the sharing economy has you know, affected cars, lodging, et cetera, but it's not really affected events. For example, if a chef wanted to you know, host a dinner and wanted to be able to charge participants to come to their house to try a new menu, there's no, there's no way you can do that. So Turnt is... Um, trying to make events, parties, et cetera, episodic, just like Uber and Airbnb have done for cars and houses. Pros Holdings, um, this is a $1.2 billion market cap company um, that I've had a long time relationship with. They were part of my portfolio at my previous hedge fund. Um, if you've bought a ticket online, uh, airline ticket, there's an 85% chance that it was priced by Pros Holdings. They have the world's most complicated data science and pricing platform. There's a lot of, uh, th they're very, very progressive uh, technologically, and they want to start building on the blockchain. So we're trying to um, uh, have a partnership with them. Uh, their senior software architect will be there, and if anyone has any questions for him on that. Uh, Augmate is my last one before I hand it over to Kevin. Um, so they want to be the world leader in managing wearables and the Internet of Things. Uh, so as you can guess, this is an extremely high-velocity, multi-transaction uh, platform. They're currently agnostic to which blockchain they're going to build on. Uh, they're looking for something that's extremely high performance and not too expensive. And uh, hopefully we can uh, convince them to uh, go our way. That's, uh, that's all I have, Kevin.
Thank you. So I'll discuss the, uh, the remainder on this list here. So Hire Free Hands is a decentralized workplace for freelancers and clients. Uh, they're based out of Nigeria. Um, they, they're using a, a novel way of uh, negotiating price, uh, sort of similar to the way that Uber does for the driver and the rider. Uh, but they're also incorporating a dispute resolution system using tokenomics. And so they're using a sort of decentralized jury system. Uh, so they have their participants um, act as the arbitrators for decisions or any sort of um, disputes. Um, MarketStar is a, uh, this is more gaming. Uh, it's an online prediction marketplace. And so uh, what, what they're doing is, is using like a musician, uh, for example, and then taking you know, their number of streams, uh, their uh, number of tweets or mentions or likes, and using that to create sort of like an index around an artist or an app or whatever it is, and users participate by sort of betting on sort of the performance of that index over a course of time. Uh, Fan Factor is actually a, a pretty cool project where they're thinking about decentralizing the fan experience and so understanding esports and, and thinking about how popular gaming is um, and allowing for decentralized ownership and also funding of campaigns that athletes and teams and leagues can get involved with together. Uh, Proof is a uh, company that's uh, coming up with a way to verify content. And so when you think about fake news and, and what's happening today, um, they're creating an ecosystem of validators that are gonna be taking a look at all of the different content and then creating betting pools around uh, proving out that the uh, actual article content, whatever it is, is actually true. Uh, Mamir is a uh, company that is thinking about um, decentralized blockchain as a service. And so if you think of Infura, but instead of centralized, uh, one company owning it, it would then be a group of people running nodes to provide an API access for off-chain applications. And so thinking about, you know, maybe if uh, someone is, uh, you know, running a business and they want to use the blockchain for some component of their application, they would do an API call uh, instead of, you know, running a node themselves and maintaining the blockchain. Uh, Prism Group is actually a blockchain economics and governance um, design firm. And so they're going to be helping us uh, with the token design and the uh, crypto economics for some of these companies that are listed here. So we want to make sure that there is actual, the, the actual incentive is structured properly so that uh, there's actually a need for a token and not just sort of uh, shoehorning it in as a solution. Um, and then we have uh, Crescent Crypto, which is actually uh, thinking about being sort of like the vanguard for uh, crypto. So thinking about a passive index fund. Uh, the relationship there is um, thinking about perhaps like an R-chain ecosystem index fund. And so having a bunch of companies that are on our platform and then assigning value to it. And so if one wanted to invest in the uh, R-chain platform and it, the companies that are on it, uh, one would have an easy way to do it. The reason why that's also very important is because Wall Street, the hedge funds, et cetera, they're, the family offices, they're all very keen on investing and they have no idea. And the Crescent Crypto guys are former Goldman guys who were in wealth management and they're sort of like translating that for them. And so it's really important for companies like this to be in the space and really thinking about you know, how they do the analysis for all of these different assets the way that it's been done in the past. And, and I would say the same applies for Prism Group, which I, I mean, they're thinking about, you know, they're actually people who have studied, um, you know, economics and have thought about incentive design. And now is an opportunity to really incorporate that discipline into what we're doing. Uh, the final one is Adapcore. Uh, Adapcore is a uh, ecosystem of sort of the payers, the providers, and the patients. Um, when you think about a healthcare ecosystem. And so all of the laws are really pushing for all of these things to be in alignment from an incentive perspective, right? 
So if the patients are more engaged or people are more engaged, then their, you know, the, the cost of managing them goes down. And so there's a way to provide more visibility from patients to doctors and um, having insurance companies provide lower premiums for patients that follow protocols. And so uh, Adapcore is uh, doing, uh, using the blockchain in order to provide um, secure data flow. Uh, that's all that we have here. Um, so if there are any questions, you know, happy to take them now, or uh, we're all here you know, for the rest of the week, so please stop by. And Jake, you got one? Yeah, so some of these are paper deals. Some of them are, we're still in negotiation, but I'd be happy to give it to you. Anybody in this room directly, like this family? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we just don't want to violate any like NDA stuff, right? Like right. that's why we don't want to do any like wide distribution, but if anyone like yeah. wants a printout, yeah, sure. We're like happy to that, print it out. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Great work, guys. Appreciate Holy it. smokes. We're on the grind. We're trying. Um, any other questions? All right. We'll yield back the time to the group. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So real quickly, um, just want to tell everyone, there's a group next door that's working on rolling contracts. So if you work with PowerFX, I'm asking you to go over there, tap them on the shoulder and say hello and answer any questions they may have about the rolling language. If you can answer them, that would be really helpful and help bring them along in learning the language. And of course, if you want to code in some rolling, then by all means, join them. They'll be working on that this afternoon. We're going to go into lunch now and then come back after lunch.